So uh, welcome, welcome to today's uh, webinar. We're going to be talking about uh, financial technology, about the analyst firms that are most valuable and why they are the most valuable. And I'm joined today by Daniel Lauver uh, and by Hannah Hayes. Um, just as a just as a note of um, uh, of welcome, we're going to be aiming to speak for not all of the hour that we have uh, booked today. But we do have the capacity to, to take questions here. Uh, my colleague Andrea is standing by peeking at any questions that get submitted. What we'll do is do our very best to address any questions uh, that, come, uh, that come forward today. Other questions, either we, not, we might not be able to answer them straight away, in which case we'll follow up with any questions that are submitted to us. Or you might not want to put questions directly into the chat. Uh, in which case, email them to uh, any of us uh, who you know, uh, or, or, and then we will follow up um, uh, accordingly uh, with you. Just to step through how the roles are kind of broken up between uh, the three of us today. So Daniel Lowther is uh, head of the Financial Technology Public Relations Group here at CCPR. He's somebody who has got really deep expertise of working with industry analysts, working with the media that influences uh, financial institutions, buyers in financial institutions, and then it's seeing how these two can play off each other and synergize each other. So he's going to introduce by talking about you know, the, the, the power of analysts, why so many people struggle to access the value that analysts generate, and what we call the, the good, okay, and the ugly, maybe the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, to be honest, in analyst relations. I'm going to be stepping through um, some research from our colleagues at the University of Edinburgh's Analyst Observatory, spotlighting analyst firms, bringing out results from the Analyst Value Survey, which asks, Pipe, which asks people in financial institutions and in fintech providers which firms they find the most useful. And then Hannah Hayes, somebody who most recently has been working in an analyst relations world role for a financial technology provider that is extremely sales driven and is really using analyst relations to drive sales, is going to draw some of the experiences in that role and other roles where analyst relations has played uh, uh, different, uh, different roles in, uh, in the organization and really speaking about the, the elements, the building blocks that will take analyst relations programs up to the highest possible level. So Daniel, I'm going to hand over to you. I'm um, uh, I've got the up key and the down key here. So please let me know when you need me to to move up or down in your in your slides. Otherwise, I'm just going to try and pace myself as you as you speak. Wonderful stuff. Thank you ever so much, Duncan. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking initially uh, around the opportunity that analyst relations affords fintech companies, based on my Goodness, goodness me, 13 years of, of experience working for, for some nimble, uh, high growth companies like uh, Flywire, Tribe Payments, Signicat, as well as some major industry brands like uh, Revolut, TravelX, and, and Visa. Um, I think um, the first thing we need to do is, is really understand, you know, what do fintech companies want? Um, so fintech companies, in my experience, uh, want three things, and that is brand awareness, market reputation, and ultimately sales leads, um, whether you're big or small, public or private, old or new. Um, they want to increase their brand awareness amongst key stakeholders, usually buyers. They want to improve market reputation allied to specific positioning differentiators or company values and they want to drive sales leads ideally inbound uh, and create platforms for engagement uh, with, with prospects and as relations can play a pivotal role in achieving all of the above um, and we're just going to go through each one of those I suppose objectives and look at how analyst relations can help. Thank you Duncan. Um, so at a base level analyst relations can help drive awareness of a company and its proposition. The most common way to achieve this is by briefing industry analysts. Uh, by briefing them regularly, you ensure the analyst is up to date 
and understands the relevance of the business to key market issues, ideally, obviously, aligned to their research focus. Now, if an analyst feels positive about the business, they may then reference or recommend uh, to, their, to their clients, who obviously are potential buyers or, or, or partners or, or, or even customers, um, write a research note or blog, uh, such as this one, uh, from Ovum uh, for one of our clients' uh, identity company called Signacap, um, or include the company in an upcoming report. Now, all these different tactics, let's say, all contribute towards getting that business on the radar. Do forgive the pun. So that's awareness. Now, moving on to reputation. Analyst relations can dramatically improve a company's market reputation. Uh, analysts are... Uh, experts in their field, and they are an authority in the market. If an analyst includes your company in a blog, report, or presentation, it is a validation of that business and proposition. It affords credibility. Now, working with analysts on proactive campaigns um, can boost cut through and create more credibility around a story or announcement, uh, especially from a product perspective. And we've done a lot of work in partnership with, with analyst firms. And you know, this doesn't have to be commercial work either. Um, and even having an analyst speak at a customer event or forum just demonstrates the, the, the company's influence and also helps to deliver advocacy. And there you can see uh, one of our, our, our clients was featured in a Forrester wave and it allowed them to be positioned as a leader in their particular market. And, you know, and that's, that's what really helps to, to boost a reputation. Um, but finally, to the, to the third piece, and that's, and that's sales, which um, yeah, is the ultimate objective for, for most fintech companies when they're looking at marketing communications. Um, and it's not just, I'm not just a market authority. They set the agenda for the market. By engaging and influencing analysts, you can help them to understand a particular problem or advocate a new technology or approach and, and ultimately help to shape the market in your favor. Because analysts understand and evaluate the market, um, their advice and guidance is extremely valuable. So by creating advocacy with these uh, key analysts, fintech companies can drive sales through, obviously, an inclusion in, in reports, especially those that evaluate and rank providers. Um, and one thing to note here, reading between the lines, is we've got to bear in mind that analyst subscriptions can be quite expensive and reports are not cheap. This means that the very, very... Um, involved readership will be highly invested in that space and is therefore likely to be a good prospect and will trust in those findings. You know, they're paying good money for this information. They're going to take this seriously. Also, as you can see here in the, in the image, um, you can work with um, analyst firms to develop um, research aligned to your uh, own uh, proposition or, or, or business focus uh, that can be used to drive sales leads in the markets. So this is an example uh, of one uh, we work with a relatively niche player called uh, Paid Strategies uh, on behalf of our client, MyTech. Um, and this was focused on KYC in the crypto space. Now, this report drove 75 uh, marketing qualified leads with cryptocurrency exchanges and helped to fuel uh, an account-based marketing uh, campaign. Um, and I understand that it contributed to a number of uh, five-figure sales leads. So, you know, for a little bit of investment and working in partnership with, with, with a firm to create some great content, um, you can drive some really strong uh, sales results. Um, and to the last two points, analysts uh, are often asked to list potential suppliers for RFPs. Um, they understand the market and they're a natural go-to if you're looking to find uh, the best technology to, to plug a hole in, in, in your bank, in your payment company, uh, in your asset manager, for example. So if they know you and rate you, they're likely to be included. Um, and more recently, analysts have been asked to conduct due diligence on potential suppliers. Um, now, in the fintech space specifically, analysts are being approached by VC and PE firms to review potential investments. So um, if you're working for a fintech firm uh, that's either looking for investment or, or, I, I, or also um, perhaps looking uh, to drive exit in a few years, um, working with analysts is an important way to get on the radar of, of, of these investment firms. 
So CC Group has commissioned independent research um, into how um, leaders uh, and technology buyers at major financial institutions select vendors. Now, these are department heads. These are C-levels. Uh, this is not an IT manager or, or, or an underling of some variety. These are people that make um, decisions on big purchases. Um, and what it revealed was that there are different, uh, both high and low priority influences at different stages of the purchase process. Um, and if we go on and start to look at what the biggest sources of influence are, we can see here that the top three are quite interesting. Now, dealing with peers first, um, it was quite interesting to us that if you're a CTO of a bank and um, you're maybe looking for a, a new uh, front-end digital banking platform or, uh, or a core payments platform or something like that, um, you'll call the CTO over, over and ask uh, him or her what, what, what they want. Um, the first and the third ones are a little bit more of interest to us. And obviously, it's good to see industry analysts there as a, as a number three influential source. But really, it is also the number one influential source. So when we dug into the data a bit further and some of the qualitative uh, information, the, the, what we found out was that business analysts primarily act upon analyst reports and trade media. So effectively, business analysts are a proxy for industry analysts there. Um, and then if we move on to the content of influence, you can see that analyst reports uh, are number one, uh, and actually by, uh, by, 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 by quite a distance. So um, if you're looking to influence buyers and drive sales, um, analysts is, uh, analyst relations is, is, is paramount. Um, the next slide looks at how fintech is, is, is a bit different, uh, I think, to some other market sectors that I've worked in. I've uh, done some work in the, in the telecom space, in the broader enterprise space. And talking with Duncan, we, we agree that there's kind of three major differences here. Uh, and that, the first one is that fintech has a, has a very rich and diverse analyst ecosystem. So you have your usual big houses, your, your gardeners and foresters, your... Um, your more uh, specific fintech firms like uh, ITE and Mercator and Sellant, uh, to some of your more boutique niche players such as uh, Paid, who I mentioned earlier. And this presents to fintech companies um, both a challenge and opportunity. The opportunity is that there's always certainly organizations that can help your business that are specific to your market that really understand um, who you want to reach. Um, but the challenge is finding out who they are and how best to engage them. Um, FinTech also has a swathe of organizations that do some of the things that analysts do. Uh, so in terms of the rise of non-traditional influences. Um, you look at Business Insider, they produce some very interesting uh, reports on particular markets or particular technologies. You look at a consultancy like 11FS, who does a lot of work around customer experience and uh, ranking different customer journeys. Um, Consult Hyperion produces um, well-regarded research notes, and a gentleman called Chris Skinner is writing a book about how banks need to uh, turn into digital banks, or he's written many books, actually. So these organizations are highly influential, but don't operate like analyst firms and therefore need a tailored approach, often based on some form of value exchange. Finally, the, the third point here, and that is the influence of these influencers. Um, we believe that influencers have a disproportionate influence on the fintech market. If you think about it, the industry is in the midst of its biggest transformation in hundreds of years, uh, around digitization, to be, to be quite frank. And the market is looking for leaders, dare I say even soothsayers, that can help them to navigate this change. Um, and that means that those traditional and non-traditional analysts that can provide guidance and vision in this space are, are, are well regarded and can confer uh, credibility uh, on, 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 your, on your business. Um, so moving on to um, some obstacles. There we go, there's an obstacle. Um, 
we believe that there are sort of three um, obstacle areas uh, which present challenges for fintech firms when they undertake um, analyst relations. Uh, and the first one is, is pretty straightforward. Um, and it's really about understanding. As, as we just uh, mentioned, there is a, uh, a rich and diverse ecosystem out there, uh, which means that um, it's very difficult for fintech firms uh, to understand uh, which firms, which analysts, and, and what level of engagement uh, should be should, should should be delivered as part of an approach, and how do you know if it's going well? Um, what does success look like? Um, and these are difficult questions around targeting and and velocity when you're looking at analyst programs. Um, the second obstacle is around expectations. Um, and when I say expectations, I mean really internal expectations. Um, and that is, you know, analyst relations at its best is a two-way street. Um, it is a conversation. Uh, and in fact, some of the best insight that you can gain in market intelligence will actually be some of the questions that we ask of analysts at the end of briefing calls or part of inquiries. Um, these, these individuals know the market uh, inside out and can really, really help to guide uh, approaches to products, for example, or strategy or market entry. Um, and that, that shouldn't be forgotten. Those expectations need to be set internally. Um, the time required, you know, it's going to take a lot of time and take senior individuals' time to build the rapport and the relationships with the most important analysts to your business. Um, and in my experience, a lot of um, fintech firms expect analysts to act like media. So you talk to an analyst and then you expect coverage. Um, but it doesn't work like that. Um, this relationship is less of an exchange and it's more of a long-term partnership. Um, and on that point, um, most programs don't see an immediate payback. Um, you need to be in it for the long haul to derive value. Um, that's not to say it cannot provide a, a quick ROI, but really this is, this is very much a marathon than a, than, than, than a sprint. Um, and then on to the, the final um, obstacle, which is, which is kind of the investment. And this is less about level of investment. Obviously, uh, the more resources you put towards something, then, then, then you're, you're more likely to, to get the result that you want. But it's really more about consistency. Um, and that is, analysts can be difficult to engage. They are highly skeptical um, and they can be hard to influence and they can be even harder to drive advocacy with. Um, so that means that you need that understanding. You need to set those internal expectations if you are to deliver that uh, return on investment, which can be incredibly high as we noted in the, in the, in the, in the initial slides. So you'll be glad to know you won't have to listen to my voice for too much longer. Um, I'm now going to talk about the, uh, the, the, the third element here, and that is kind of the options, which is really the good, the bad, and the, and the ugly around um, approaches to analyst relations that, that we've seen. So I'm going to try to sort of paint a picture uh, and a typology of, 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 of what these look like. So uh, the first typology is uh, the good, and that is creating a dialogue. So... This looks like a conversation that starts from analysts' interest. It builds on analysts' past research and future agenda. It uses the analyst language and it amplifies support, supported analysts beyond their current audience. It's about also you helping that analyst because together you're going to help each other to grow stronger. That's, that's good. That's a dialogue. Now, what bad? Um, and this is, unfortunately, bad is quite commonplace. Um, and bad is, 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 I think, best described as broadcast, and that is a proactive distribution of relevant content. It is a, it is a, is a telling and not a listening. Uh, it's not adapting to analyst interests. Uh, it's not prioritizing analysts with the right impact on customers. It's very much a, a spray and pray approach, which um, isn't the best, but can see some limited success. Finally, the ugly option. Um, 
that's really what I've <laughs> the titled here is uh, titled here is entitled, um, and that's a pacifying monologue. It's it's about using jargon unique to that vendor. It's focusing on analysts would say yes and give you their time, but probably don't actually um, impact upon your customers or your market, and it ignores influential but unconvinced analysts, which might challenge you. Um, and, and, and that's, that's an example of ugly. And where possible, we try to deliver analyst programs uh, which are focused on, uh, on building a dialogue and, 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 and the good. Um, finally, um, one sort of remark before I hand over to Duncan, who's going to provide more insight into exactly the different type of, um, of, of of fintech uh, analyst firms um, you might want to look to work with in different areas. Um, you know, I mainly work in public relations, but I've done a, a lot of work in analyst relations. And I believe that PR and AR is a match made in heaven. They are inherently symbiotic. So PR can amplify and increase the impact of great AR, and AR can amplify and increase the impact of great PR. Um, and together they're, and together they're much stronger uh, as a whole. Um, so, on that note, thank you very much for, for listening. I uh, look forward to hearing your questions a little bit later, and I shall uh, hand the baton over to uh, Mr. Duncan Chap. Okay, thank you so much for that, Daniel. And so what I want to do in, uh, in, in my few slides uh, before Hannah is kind of spotlight some, some data that we've been involved in, uh, in publicizing from, uh, from colleagues at the University of, uh, uh, of Edinburgh. And something that people may have seen in the in the middle of December, I think it was December 19th or 20th, the University of Edinburgh uh, published the Analyst Firm Awards. So uh, for people who, who are not aware with the work that's, that's happening there, the British government has given uh, the University of, of Edinburgh, I think it's something like half a million dollars uh, for a three-year project to investigate the impact of uh, industry analysts in different markets. And one of the uh, things that they do is a study looking at people who are consuming uh, analyst insight uh, and analyst services around financial technologies. So CC Group is really intrigued by this. We're a really data-driven uh, organization. And so we are very happy to be the sponsor of these uh, FinTech uh, Analyst Firm Awards. And it gives us a little bit of access to the data that they've been collecting at the University of Edinburgh and that they've been studying in the, in the Analyst Observatory. So people who aren't familiar with the, with the awards, it's, a, it's an annual award that I think has been run since 2013, 2014, leveraging this annual survey conducted by the Analyst Observatory. And amongst other things, that there are three main questions in the survey. So it's a survey of users of, uh, of research, both on the kind of demand side and on the supply side, so including people who work for financial institutions, but also people who work for organizations that provide technology that, that power uh, financial institutions. And these users are asked three questions. Firstly, what topics are you using analysts for? Secondly, which services that analysts provide are the most valuable? And then thirdly, which firms are most valuable at providing these services? And so they combine this and then have a calculation that allows them to see how much value is each firm producing and how are they, uh, how do they compare with each other? So there are different elements to financial technology. This is the way that the Analyst Observatory uh, defines it. It's pretty much anything that's called financial technology. And then in particular, technologies that are inside these uh, seven uh, subcategories. So those seven and financial technology at the top roll up into the, the coverage areas that they consider to be valuable. So if you're a user of analyst research in a financial institution or anywhere else, and you're consuming research on any of these topics, then you are included for this. So then which are the firms that are most influential on these people? So there are a couple of different ways that the Analyst Firm Awards shows this. Firstly, on the, on the left-hand side, there's a group of, of what the observatory calls platinum providers. So taken together, these six firms 
provide most of the value that is being generated by the analyst industry uh, for, for people who are consuming fintech analyst insight. And then when you add on to them the gold firms, so the platinum and the gold firms added together produce more than two thirds of all of the analyst value being created by analyst firms. And then of course, beyond these top two groups, there is a very, very long tail of organizational, um, of, of organizations providing value. And actually comparing these results to results from 2017, there's actually remarkably little change. The only firm that seems to have um, uh, kind of um, risen up a little bit is, is Nelson Hall. And I suppose one interesting thing here is that many of the organizations here are generalists. You know, there is one of these uh, uh, kind of uh, niche players, Salant. And then, of course, underneath that are, are the other firms that, that, that Daniel referred to, like ITA, Mercator, and, and, and many others. What we're able to show, share with you uh, this uh, in, in today's webinar is a slightly different analysis of these data. So, firstly, it's interesting to compare uh, the results against uh, the previous study, 2017. Very, very stable. Although there's a lot of competition, there is a lot of stability, but there's something hidden in the data. And that are these hidden champions. So the way that the analyst firm awards are calculated, it looks at the people who are using research on these financial technology uh, topics. But of course, some people are more deeply immersed in fintech than others. So for example, some people might be consuming research about five, six, seven of these different topics and others might be consuming research on one of them. Some people might be consuming research on topics that are only in the financial technology space. Others might be using research very broadly on a wider range of technologies. But what this hidden champions methodology does is it spotlights the firms that are used more heavily by fintech insiders, I suppose, by people who are using only or mostly in financial technology. There are a couple of differences in the way that the firms uh, appear. The one difference that comes out here at number five is the writing option in the survey, other. So insiders are more likely to be using smaller boutique firms that don't punch into the top 10. And of course, these other firms, there are many, many, many of them, but it gives a sense of how important that long tail of niche firms is. And then there are two firms at number six and number seven uh, that pop in uh, that are not present in the, in the top 10 for this year or even in the top 10 in previous years. One of these is Aragon Research. If you're in North America, you might have come across Aragon Research. This is Jim Lundy's uh, firm. So Jim is a, a Gartner alumnus who set up his own firm several years ago and has really been able to make a substantial uh, impact. And I think especially uh, through being able to organize uh, award events and conferences, it's really been able to provide opportunities for, for buyers to come together. And actually that's also one of the strengths of Kupinger Coal, the other firm that, that is shown as being a hidden champion that didn't get into our top 10. This is a European firm, a German headquartered firm that is a real leader in uh, identity and access management. Obviously this is a much more profound problem for financial uh, technology providers than for I don't know, enterprises, for example. You, you, you want to protect your uh, corporate bank account a little bit more than you want to protect or your, uh, your, your supermarket shopping list, say. Uh, so these firms have performed extremely strongly. And for us, it's really intriguing to see the way that these data gives a very different lens on the financial technology market. And in particular, it shows us that while many of our vendor clients are deeply engaged in niche providers that often have strong expertise, really deep expertise, in financial technology. Actually, it's the generalist firms that are often most used that have got the biggest customer bases that have got the most leverage in many decisions. So I want to move on now to, uh, to Hannah's, but it, it's just such a privilege to have somebody who is a, is a Forrester alumna, who has worked really broadly across the 
extremely wide range of uh, of organizations and has been able to add uh, add a lot to the way that we understand things in the in the analyst industry so i'm just going to uh, move on now to hannah hannah i'm going to mute my audio and uh, I'm afraid you'll have to do something pushing your finger up and down in the air wildly to, to, to give me an idea of when to move up and down in the slides. <laughs> All right, fantastic. Well, thank you, Duncan, um, for having me on the call. And um, so I'm gonna just dive in a little bit deeper into what Daniel and Duncan were talking about um, and hopefully give some ideas that you can use in your own programs. But if you've read Duncan's blog, you've probably heard of or run across the ideal methodology. Um, and I think it's a really great framework for running any AR program, regardless of the industry that you're in. So um, the first step, and I'll go through each of the steps and give you some examples um, around each of these steps. So. Uh, if we go in, in the ideal methodology, so it's identifying um, the type of program and your analyst, drive um, measurements and, and goals, uh, engaging your analyst, aligning AR, and then leveraging the benefits of AR. So that's where you get that ideal. So if we go to the next slide and talk about identifying. And so sometimes folks will think, oh, identifying, this means that I have to find the right analyst. Well, actually, before you find the right analyst, I think it's really important to understand what your particular organization needs. So what that means is you need to hold um, what I call a listening tour of your stakeholders, really take some time to understand what's driving them, what problems are they trying to solve, where might they need some assistance, um, outside of your direct stakeholders, you know, go wider, go deeper in your organization. Um, so I've, you know, spent time even talking to every regional sales manager um, in an organization to understand what they're dealing with. Um, read your company's financial results, their goals. You should really become the expert on your company and where your company's going. Um, and then once you really understand where your company's going, what are the problems that you're dealing with, then you can determine what type of program that you wanna run for your company. So for example, with Microsoft Dynamics, we did a lot of AR for PR work um, and product advisory work. Um, and then with SAP, it was you know awareness. Um, and then with TradeShift, I did a lot of work with AR for sales. Um, but each program was specifically designed for that organization. And then once you understand those needs, then you can start looking at your analyst. So you don't want to, and, and I highly stress this, don't assume that Gartner and Forrester are gonna be your number one analyst. Um, especially in an area like FinTech, they might not have the capabilities that you're really looking for. So for example, when I was with TradeShift, um, they're a payments firm and Forrester and Gartner didn't have exactly what we were looking for. And so we had to really look at some of the more niche firms. Um, so a couple that weren't on here is Spend Matters and Ardent Partners um, for payments. Um, so, really look at, you know, what's going to make the most sense for you for identifying your analysts. I like to use architect. They have a great feature that you can use just a little sales plug, I guess, but um, they have some great research features that you can use to try to figure out who's writing um, and on what topics that you might want to outreach um, to particular analysts. But you know, if you don't have architect, Google um, works just as well, um, sometimes just a little bit more time consuming. But I think your sales team also, like if you're not talking to your sales teams, highly recommend go talk to your sales teams because they're also a great resource um, to figure out who, you know, which analysts they might be running across in deals and, and what they're hearing out in the field. Um, and then once you identify your analyst, make sure that you tier them. You can't give everyone the love. 
um, you really need to make sure that you can give quality attention to the right analyst. So my tier one analyst that I'm talking to, you know, at least every other month, I'm going to have 10 of them. Maybe tier two, I'll have 10, and then there's everyone else. So that's identifying. So if we go on to the next slide, driving, um, you really need to understand, again, um, so to drive your programs, um, remember that your analysts are people. They have a really, a lot of them have specific ways that they like to work, things that they care about. Um, so I would say, you know, when I start driving my engagements, I like to do an overall SWOT um, analysis, and then I look really closely at what my analysts are saying. So how are we compared to other vendors? What's our profile? Are they, um, are the analysts going to be recommending us versus competitors? Um, is there a magic quadrant I want to be in, or maybe I don't want to be in? Um, and once you identify those goals, then uh, or objectives, then you're able to really drive uh, your program. Uh, so, for example, you know, again, at Trade Shift, there was magic quadrants that we were in that we probably shouldn't have been in, so we worked to try to move ourselves out of those into more um, payments-focused research. So, um, all right, so then the next is engaging. And so you have your goals, you have your tiering list and an understanding of what you're trying to drive. Um, now, if you remember, Daniel talked about the good and having good conversations and dialogue with your analysts. And I, I can't stress it enough. You really need to look at how are you creating mutually beneficial relationships so yeah, it's easy to understand that, okay, I've got a magic quadrant that'll come out every year and a wave that's gonna come out roughly every 18 months. But outside of that, are there pet projects that your analysts might be working on that you can help um, provide more information? Um, do you have analysts that maybe, um, so for example, I actually had an analyst that would only take one briefing from me per year. So how do you work around that and make sure that you can still provide a um, mutually beneficial relationship when they only want to do one briefing year? So are you utilizing other strategies or putting customers in front of them? Um, another analyst I worked with, he was considered really difficult. Um, but then once you get to know them, I found out that they were really just a customer advocate. And so then it was easy to tailor my program around how to make that person feel involved. So if you've worked with me or talked to me, you'll hear me say that no one calls their baby ugly. Um, so what that means is how do you get the analyst to feel that your product, your service, what you're doing is also part of their baby as well? And the more that you can engage with them, um, getting their advice, showing them how you're leveraging the advice that um, they're giving you and implying that, um, the more that you can make them feel like they're part of your baby, um, the easier it is gonna be for them to become an advocate and, and really get the results that you're looking for. Um, the line, so, if you remember the first step where you identified the needs of your business and where AR could add the most value, do this again and again. Uh, you want to repeat this. You want to make sure, so I meet with my main stakeholders um, at a minimum every other week, and I'm talking about, okay, here's what we've accomplished so far, and here's what we need to do next. Um, I also make sure that in order to really gain buy-in um, from my stakeholders, I make sure that there's um, activity and research calendars. I try to cut down on surprises. Um, and I think that's because it's a lot easier if your stakeholders can say, I need to give Hannah one hour this, this month, two hours next month, and oh no, we have a wave coming up, so the two months after that, she's gonna want like 10 hours of my time. Um, 
then they're more uh, aligned and understand what to expect. Um, and it really helps them to understand where you're making um, impact as part of those ongoing conversations. Um, and never stop educating internally. So I have decks for sales teams. I have educational decks for marketing teams and executive teams, right? So I'm always educating internally on where folks might be able to leverage analyst relations um, to help their particular part in the business. Um, which that actually is a perfect line into um, the final step, which is leverage. So. Um, my favorite, favorite thing about analyst relations is that I think it's one of those rare roles where you can really add benefit regardless of the or where you're at in the organization. Um, so I've worked with smart CEOs that leverage analysts to help inform their market um, and, and the strategy of where they're going forward. Um, I've worked with product teams that have, you know, had conversations about a potential product and then gone all the way to market with those. Um, so I think the more that you can educate across the organization on where AR might add benefit, the better off you are. Um, and really making sure that you're tailoring your program specifically to your organization um, and identifying the right analysts that can help you with that. So, you know, one, there's for some firms, especially and there's a lot of great firms that Duncan mentioned that I've worked with. And then there's other firms, especially if you start diving into like the really niche markets like payments, um, where you might find some firms that are a little bit smaller, but can add some incredible value and are will, um, will be more willing to negotiate potentially, depending on what you're trying to do um, because they're smaller. So for example, I worked with a firm that was giving us unlimited inquiry and advisory um, to help the sales teams pivot and, and have new conversations based on a, a strategy that we were changing. Um, so anyway, to summarize, I would say, make sure that you're picking the right analyst for you and your organizational goals. Um, set those goals, determine how to make the analyst love your ugly baby, um, share your results and insights internally, and then repeat broadly and often. So I'm going to stop there so we have some time to answer um, potential questions that will come in. Um, but if anyone wants to talk further, I'm happy to as well. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so I think we've got time now for, for questions and, and, and comments. Okay, so um, just to just to wrap some some things up, um, we will send an email out to people who registered for the webinar with a link to the uh, with a link to the uh, recording. Sadly, there's nothing that we can do about my hopeless misuse of the up and up and down question. Um, all right, okay. We have a question in. Uh, why do we think Alan? And no, honestly, I don't know about that. Uh, it's just the just the statistical analysis. I mean, Salon showed up. Um, I think it's probably about the ratio between premium and premium users. Salon, of course, showed up in the in the in the top ten. Uh, maybe what pushed Salon out of the top ten for hidden champions could be the fact that that kind of other category, you know, that write-in option, uh, is more popular amongst people who. Are industry insiders. They might be more useful to use a, I don't know, a, a paid strategies or, or somebody, somebody like that. I think with ITE, that's a much simpler answer. That I don't think ITE has really uh, gotten into the whole uh, freemium thing as effectively. You know, it, it definitely has a broader diffusion than some other analyst terms because of how effectively it uses reprints. And, and definitely, I've seen that for. For our clients, you know, ITA reprints really, you know, and silent reprints, reprints generally, you know, they are super effective uh, tools. But I think ITA doesn't have the same uh, freemium setup that some of the other uh, analyst terms have been able to develop. And I think that smaller user base uh, you know, just hits against it in the methodology for the, uh, for the, uh, for the analyst values. 
Okay, so I was saying, so we're going to um, wrap up the video. We'll send out a link to uh, to that for people. If you've got questions or comments that, that you are too shy to ask in front of, you know, other people, then feel free to email them out. Oh, hang on, there's another, there's another question in here, how to identify the right analysts. Well, I suppose how to identify the right analyst is complex. It's a complex question. Um, I think, in a way, the best answer for that was, was given by Hannah. You, know, you have to speak to your stakeholders and see uh, which stakeholders uh, are valuing different analyst firms. Your salespeople, in particular, are probably going to have a much better idea than your product management people about which analyst firms are really impacting on your, uh, on your prospects and on your market. Generally, what we find is organizations get a little bit myopic. You know, they think that the analyst firms that are useful for their product managers are the analyst firms that are serving uh, the demand side. But actually, there tend to be rather different analyst firms that are able to sell into, the, into, into suppliers. You know, the vendor market is small. It's quite concentrated. The financial institution market is massive. So really, it's very large firms that are able to sell effectively into financial institutions. And smaller analyst firms tend to be more likely to be influential on the vendor side. So it's important that we don't confuse the firms that are influential on the, on the supply side and imagine that they are influential on the, on the demand side. Um, OK, I think there are no more questions. So thank you so much uh, for, your, for your feedback. Obviously, thank you so much for Hannah bringing together this uh, you know, um, um, amazing experience, uh, you know, uh, uh, definitely, you know, deep knowledge of, of firms in the, in the fintech space, but also this much broader experience of kind of uh, full service technology firms that are trying to verticalize their analyst relations and sell maybe horizontal technologies, but into uh, financial institutions. And thank you so much, Daniel, as well, for being able to share this really joined up picture of the, the value of analyst relations and the way that analyst relations is making an impact for public relations uh, driven analyst relations programs as well for sales driven uh, analyst relations programs. Okay, thank you so much.